Hot off the heels of our video on the Cadian Shock Troops, I'd like to continue our romp through some of the various famous regiments of the Imperial Guard. One of the standout factions, or at least just another one of my favorites, are the Death Corps of Krieg. To my extreme disappointment, the Death Corps of Krieg aren't even mentioned anywhere in the 8th edition Astra Militarum army book. In fact, the only way to even get some of these models is through Forge World. So hopefully this video will shed some light on an older regiment, but an awesome one nonetheless. They have a very brutal history that is born from nuclear war and a civil war spanning centuries that spawned one of the most balls out insane and durable Imperial Guard regiments in the Imperium. So let's dive in on the history of a regiment that 8th edition forgot, but a lot of us fondly remember, the Death Corps of Krieg. Our tale begins in the Segmentum Tempestus, the galactic south of the Imperium. This segmentum is home to a grip of already famous locations such as Talarn, Baca, and one planet no one has ever heard of, Necromunda. Now, amongst the star-studded cast of planets is the hive world of Krieg, a sprawling world that acted as a major trade and manufacturing hub throughout the sector. Now, this is a direct juxtaposition to the current barren, irradiated wasteland of Fallout. I mean, modern-day Krieg. Although Krieg was a center of commerce, it hid a dark secret in its ruling caste, the Council of Autocrats. This oligarchy was filled with corrupt and decadent individuals that fell further and further from the Emperor's grace, the richer they became. I like to compare it sort of uh, to an insular ruling caste of a pre-World War I ruling family. Uh, the Habsburgs come to mind. So imagine a corrupt ruling family, all with Habsburg jaws and harems throughout the finer parts of Krieg's hive cities. And as the autocrats grew in power, so did their paranoia, believing the administratum or departmentum munitorum uh, would try to supplant their power or quote unquote their homeworld. And this was a farce, as all worlds of the Imperium belonged to the Emperor by Imperial decree. You can into my sarcasm on that. But the results were a massive fortification or massive fortifications being erected through the hive cities and private armies that were supplied directly from the autocrats outside of the Munitorum or Imperial Tithes reach. But let me take a brief second to segue into what the Imperial Tithe is, as it is important to the overall narrative of this regiment and a lot of the other regiments that we're going to talk about. So the tithe, or as it's also known as a Terra's Due, or the Grand Harvest, is essentially the tax that every planet must pay back to the Adeptus Terra. This tithe ensures that the Imperium can continue to function across all the many sectors and segmentums of the uh, galaxy. And it all really comes down to the type and the size of each world. So no tithe is ultimately the same. Uh, Krieg at the time probably had to provide some manufacturing elements and then soldiers per their tithe. Worlds like agro worlds provide food and other agricultural goods, you know, so on and so forth. But your tithe is dictated by your world's type, but every world must also provide Imperial Guard regiments to fuel the Imperial War Machine. These tithes are broken into 16 different grades, with three tiers existing in each grade. Uh, Exactis Extremis being the largest tithe grade, and Salutio Tertius being the lowest. Well, to be fair, uh, Aptus Nun is the lowest, but that is zero tithe as a result of an exterminatus. So, you know, not much to give, but tears and dust, and at that point, we all know the Emperor has that in great supply. So, back on track here. With the autocrats looking to dodge tithes and ignore the demand of the Adeptus Terra as a whole, Krieg went to make some independent moves of its own. The High Autocrat and Chairman of the Council of Autocrats, uh, the guy who was essentially the planetary governor, declared Krieg's independence from the Imperium, as well as issuing martial law across the entire planet, going a step further and denouncing the Emperor directly or entirely. And this caused an immediate rift and fracturing of the people, a full half committed to the heretical, rebellious ways of the autocrats, and the other committed to the emperor. And a civil war broke out, resulting in the autocrats' private armies sweeping through any loyalist elements for the exception of Hive, Ferrograd, the last remaining loyalist faction on the planet under Colonel Yurton, the man who would go on to lead the resistance against the rebellion. And no, he wasn't a Jedi. At the onset of the Civil War, Yurton issued a military coup, removing the autocrats of High Ferrograd and creating a beacon for all those still loyal to the Imperium and the Emperor. The problem was that the majority of the planet had already been taken over by the rebels. 
Cut off from the rest of the Imperium, Erograd was besieged. Requesting aid from the Segmentum Command, Yurton was told that no aid would be coming in the near future and that his orders were to resist and punish the heretics, no matter the cost. And this is a very atypical Imperial answer, uh, especially as it concerns any other hive world in a non-strategic location. You have to understand, the Imperium is massive, and planets fall to a planetary governor's corruption almost daily. The typical response is to leave the planet be until the lack of resources weaken the planet that an Imperial fleet can be mustered when it's most convenient. It seems the overall tactic is to handle a multitude of planets at once versus jumping on each sedition as it happens. I, unless, of course, the ruinous powers are involved. You know, then the Adeptus Hereticus is up that planet's ass with a flamethrower and the good word of the Emperor. But Colonel Yurton saw the odds were stacked against him, so he went for a trump card. Utilizing his connections with the Adeptus Mechanicus, Yurden accessed an ancient and deadly weapon hidden deep within Hive Ferrograd. Biding his time and taking the proper precautions, Yurden waited to unleash his trump card on Krieg. On the day of the Feast of the Emperor's Ascension, Colonel Yurden bombed the entirety of Hive World Krieg with atomic ballistic missiles, which, in all honesty, I mean, doesn't really seem very ancient. But most of the rebellious hubs were covered in nuclear hellfire as the planet was blanketed with radiation, resulting in a nuclear winter as the sun was blocked out from the massive fallout eating the planet's surface. This act went on to be known as the Purging, and while drastic, the Loyalists had been prepared. Creating a vast network of bunkers and subterranean systems underneath the planet, the Rebels, on the other hand, died in the billions to the atomic blasts that riddled the planet. The Civil War continued for many years, and the Administratum had now looked on the world as a lost cause. All means of infrastructure had been completely annihilated, while the crust was entirely irradiated, marking the planet as a man-made death world. The generations of Loyalists and Rebels fought on throughout the radiation-soaked wasteland. Trenches, razor wire, artillery craters, and fortifications dotted the hellscape of the planet. Generations lived and died under these conditions. For years upon years, the two factions fought one another, sometimes in deadly stalemates, other times losing or gaining ground. A tradition of death in the Emperor's name was born into the Loyalists of Krieg, knowing the harshest of conditions imaginable and fighting solely to return the planet to the Emperor's light. For 500 long, grueling years, the planet was locked in its civil war until it was finally returned to the Imperial fold in the year 949 in the 40th millennium by the victory of the Loyalist forces. But there was little fanfare for a death world rejoining the Imperium. There's very little such a world can provide except for a tithe of soldiers. The Departmento Munitorum demanded just that, realizing that the planet was in rears, you know, much like a late Fiat blockbuster. Krieg responded by sending not just a single regiment, but 20 full trained, equipped and disciplined regiments back to the Munitorum each one of the commanders requesting the most hazardous and deadly Imperial war zones available. During the expanse of the Civil War, the soldiers of Krieg had expanded their underground network below Ferrograd to encompass the majority of the planet, creating manufacturing facilities, sprawling cities, and vast bunker systems. The soldiers sent out to the Departmento Munitorum took to their jobs with great zeal, becoming standout regiments wherever they were deployed. The Death Corps were fearless in their determination to the Emperor, and dying a glorious, self-sacrificing death was their singular goal to ensure two things. One, an act of repentance for the planet's past transgressions, and two, to show their dedication to the God Emperor. The High Lords of Terra, noting how exemplary the Death Corps were performing, demanded that Krieg continue to produce more and more regiments for the Imperium, giving them the highest grade of tithe. Krieg would then go on to provide an increasingly high amount of regiments as the sole portion of their tithe rather than providing any goods to the Imperium. Krieg was even granted certain boons to ensure their production of soldiers would never falter or dwindle. Some of these included eugenics that allowed for the reduction in mutations across Krieg's infants. One of the biggest and probably most controversial practices is the Vitae womb. This is essentially a, a means of genetically enhancing the reproduction efforts of the planet, uh, ensuring that they meet the 50 million annual soldier quota. But we don't know exactly what this means. Uh, it could be humans that are vac grown, uh, drugs that increase fertility, or a means of speeding up the pregnancy process as a whole. But the result is as desired, and Krieg continues to meet their quota, 
year after year. Following with the lineage of this planet, Krieg has gone from a sprawling hive world to a barren death world to finally a war world in the span of 500 or so years. War World's resources are devoted entirely to the offering of Imperial Guard regiments to the Greater Imperium. The term Total War comes to mind. The Death Corps of Krieg have gone to earn both fame and notoriety in many fronts across the galaxy. The Spinward Front, a massive front across the uh, periphery sector of the Segmentum Obscurus, has seen the Corps carve a name for itself amongst Eldar, Dark Eldar, and Orc victories. Further, the Death Corps has fought during famous campaigns such as the Third War of Armageddon, leading the defense of Hive Tartarus using their precise artillery barrages to support elements of the Legio Metallica and also counter-attacking the besieging orcs and playing Until It Sleeps, Unforgiven, and a number of other Metallica songs way into the night. Across the galaxy, the Death Corps has earned its namesake as their disproportionately high fatality rate gives credence to the regiment's willingness to die in the Emperor's name. This has also led to some morale issues with Death Corps leading non-Krieg-born regiments into battle, as the credo that Colonel Yurton's forces fought under 500 years ago is still ill-received on other regiments. Victory at any cost. Which actually might be a great segue into going into how the Death Corps exacts the Emperor's wrath upon their foes, because it's very different from a lot of the other Imperial Guard regiments. I mean, it's not the guerrilla warfare of, say, the Katachan, but rather the Death Corps excel in both siege and trench warfare. Especially trench warfare, that's a little bit of a unique one. Uh, fighting a five-century-long civil war, it'll do that to you. Their siege regiments work under a constant hail of heavy weapons fire support and trench systems to push the enemy further back, precise artillery barrages acting as a moving shield for the Death Corps. Underneath this excellence is a very evident and overt zeal for the Emperor. The Death Corps will follow orders to the letter, and they have only ever fallen back once in their entire Imperial record. And even then, it was during the Siege of Vrox, where the Purge, which is a uh, unit of chaos, used some of the worst chemical weapons to date. And even further, they only fell back like one trench line. So to say that the Death Corps are steadfast is an understatement. Even their pilots are completely insane. They will fly into suicidal missions, bombing and establishing air superiority until their munitions are depleted or their crafts are damaged beyond repair, which they will then kamikaze into the enemy's defenses to help clear the way for more attacks. They even employ horsemen, known in previous editions as Rough Riders, although the cores are named Death Riders, because why would they not have a disgustingly awesome name like that? The overall battle doctrine for the Death Corps relies on overwhelming force applied continuously. Basically, these suicidal badasses work under the auspice that as long as their desire to fight and die for the Emperor outweighs the enemy's willingness to die, the battle is already won and it's just a matter of time. Which is clearly a brazen, gigantic testicle way to approach any conflict. But recruitment into this cult of kick-ass is by no means an easy ordeal. Just like the shock troops of Cadia, the Death Corps trains all of its citizens to become guardsmen as early as possible. I'd argue though that the Cadians are probably a bit more forgiving with their training regiments. The Death Corps are taught to obey orders no matter the cost, to be forthright in the face of fear, and to undergo some of the harshest conditions imaginable for any guardsman. With a planet pockmarked with all the hallmarks of a nuclear war, Krieg acts as an amazing training ground, with cadets doing forced marches through the irradiated wastelands, uh, building new trench systems, clearing old minefields, and having mock battles with other regiments of cadets. For as many men as Krieg produces for the Munitorum, they lose just as many, if not more, during the rigorous training that all corpsmen must undergo. The unforgiving planet and training process weeding out the weak so that the only the strong and devout may remain. Even before being promoted to a line soldier from cadet, each member of the Death Corps is granted the panoply of their regiment. And it's, it's easy to make the mistake between the Steel Legion and the Death Corps of Krieg at first glance. They both have rebreathers and large coats. But the Death Corps tends to have darker coats, varying shades of deep gray, browns, blacks, stuff like that while the Legion favors brighter colors, as befits the brighter landscape of Armageddon, where the Steel Legion calls home. In addition, the Death Corps often fanish fashions their rebreather masks into grimacing skulls, and other means of striking fear into the enemies of the Emperor. If we're going on 
purely semantics, Steel Legion has more of a World War II vibe, World War II German vibe to be exact, while the Death Corps borrows heavily from World War I German and French influences, such as the armor that typically adorns their shoulders or carapaces. Namely, of course, the Death Corps, uh, I think it's called Stahlhelm style of uh, World War I helmet versus the Steel Legion World War II style of German helmet. And I might be off on the naming mechanic of that helmet style, so feel free to correct me in the, in the comments below. But this all leads to an extremely uniform regimen, no pun intended. Uh, for the most part, the Death Corps doesn't believe in any sort of ostentatious display of organization across the regiment. Uh, in fact, the organization is very standard for an Imperial Guard regiment, with the only display of rank coming from simple change of ornamentation upon helmets or a C on a shoulder pad to denote someone is a member of the command squad. Uh, medals, regal aquilas, or any kind of display of merit is pretty much just seen as superfluous. Uh, everyone fights in the front, from the command elements to the base line infantry. There is no real kind of rear echelon for the Death Corps. And as such, there are very little actual distinct characteristics of the regiment that break from the standard organization, like I was saying. Uh, sergeants are renamed Watchmasters, and are actually a bit more veteran than the standard sergeant that you would see in any other Imperial Guard regiment. As any Watchmaster is a former member of the elite heavy infantry unit, the Death Corps Grenadiers. After serving as a member of the Grenadiers, the individual rejoins the line infantry as a Watchmaster. But with a 80% fatality rate in the Grenadier squads, you can imagine that this makes for some very grizzled and capable leaders. And one of the only other separations from the standard regimental organization is the use of what the Corps calls Quartermasters. And these guys don't organize like MacBook Pros or anything like that. This is pretty intense. Uh, born from the time of the Civil War, uh, Quartermasters would go about the battlefield and salvage any equipment that they could. Uh, ultimately, the rule was if you could not personally walk yourself back to a medical station or if your environmental suit was compromised, you were already dead. The Quartermaster would then issue you the Emperor's Peace, executing the wounded. These guys almost serve as kind of a role similar to apothecaries, harvesting the equipment of the fallen as well as tending to any field triage to the wounded that they're capable of doing. Lastly, the Commissars of the Death Corps are actually used very differently from what we have come to expect from other regiments. Rather than acting as a tool of maintaining leadership and shooting anyone that would retreat, the Commissars help to add to the religious fervor of the Death Corps, but also restraining them so that they do not uh, prematurely charge or expose themselves. Not like illicitly, like I mean like from their position. Uh, these are the only elements of the Death Corps that, are, that do not actually hail from Krieg itself. So they mainly act as tactical advisors to discuss bigger picture tactical movements or talking between regimental command. It's a far more passive role for the Commissar than we typically see in other Imperial Guard regiments. But that really sums up the things that make the Death Corps of Krieg different from an organizational standpoint. But no matter how you cut it, the Death Corps is a regiment entirely in a league of its own. As we go through these regiments, you'll find that each one of them specializes so heavily in one direction that it's a definite kind of duh moment when it comes to being a regiment of any type of renown. The Death Corps, though, have a very well-rounded, overwhelming zeal for the Emperor that has even earned them the respective foes like the Orcs and Necrons for their implacable and tenacious approach to warfare. As I mentioned earlier, the grinding wheel of 8th edition moving ever onward, there is a fear that this regiment might be left in the dust of Forge World, only getting model and rules updates sparingly. And I'm glad you could join me on this journey through the long history of Krieg and the rest record of excellence that the Death Corps operates under before the prospect of them fading into obscurity becomes a reality. Now, I have no idea if they actually will, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a possibility. The Death Corps doesn't have a victorious and epic shout like Cadia stands, but for those that call Krieg home, there is no need for such a flourish. Service and death to the Emperor is all that matters. Thanks so much for joining me here today, guys. If you have any questions or requests for the next video on uh, the Imperial Regiments you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments below. But as always, have a good one and take care.